So I'm walking on the beach of Pakamat, just a few kilometers east of the town of Kotobaru. Behind me is the South China Sea. It was here in the very early hours of the morning of uh, 8th of December 1941 that the Imperial Japanese Army landed and the invasion of Malaysia began. Here today is a quiet beach with no obstacles. The Japanese had to come through in the dark on landing craft in three waves in rough seas. They say that the, the swells were as high as three meters because it was monsoon season. And once they hit these beaches, they had to fight their way through three strips of barbed wire defenses, past pillboxes, and in through the jungle, swampy ground, and make their way to the airbase, all to secure air superiority for their invasion of Malaysia. So today, our club, Fireteam Elias, will be refighting this battle. Come, join me. Let's get into action. So I'm back in Singapore, and I'm with the members of Fireteam Elias, who will be refighting the Battle of Kotobaru with me today. To my immediate left is Alfred, Ethan, Nabil, Jared, the other Eugene, Darren and his youngest son, Evan, Zul, who came dressed for the party, Anthony and Darth. Another of our members, Joshua, would be joining us later in the day. The terrain around the Kalantan River, where it empties into the South China Sea, is flat and makes for a good airbase. The large beaches are lined with palm trees and beyond that uh, there are smaller rivers and swampy ground. I built the 6 by 12 foot table to represent the landing beaches near Kotobaru. To add to the fog of war, and to make it a little more interesting for the Japanese players, I didn't allow any of the Japanese players into the room where the table had been set up before the game started. Instead, I invited Evan, the youngest member of our club, into the room to survey the table and to be a Mr. Hayakawa, who historically had worked in the region before the war and was actually on board the convoy heading to Kotobaru to be a guide for the Japanese army. However, Takumi writes in his book that he wasn't satisfied with the information that Mr. Hayakawa had gathered. Uh, Takumi actually wants to know more about the uh, specifics of the British army and their military equipment in the region. Anyway, then Evan had to take the uh, information back to the planning room where Anthony, who was going to be uh, the commander-in-chief of the Japanese forces for the day, and his fellow players, uh, for them to work with their limited intel and plan their attack. The intel provided to us by Mr. Hakagawa showed us that there were three rivers flowing from west to east, creating what was in effect two quadrants. The northern quadrant that contained the airfield and the southern quadrant that contained some sort of village and what looked like an artillery park. His intel also showed that the centre river, uh, that the British forces were divided by this centre river. And they were mostly congregated to the south of the map and to the north of the map. And it was decided that we could uh, create a fainting attack to the north of the river and force any British there into the north, to the north, while our major force could attack to the south of this central river and drive any forces to the south, therefore splitting the British and stopping them from, in effect, linking up. 
that would then give us easy access and we would be able to support each, although we would have the river between our forces, we would be able to quickly support each other across that river and at least be anchored with a friendly ally on either side of our, ourselves. As the commander of the defending forces, I had no idea the size or the equipment of Japanese force. I therefore chose to hold my HQ and Zeus button back in reserve and then have Ether to defend the south and Jared to the north of the river. Knowing this was a rather thin spread, I felt I had no choice and hoped that my reserve could reinforce where the most of the attacker would land me. In spite of heavy shelling and regular sorties made by Lockheed Hudson Bombs of No. 1 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force, based at RAF Kotobaru, Ants and his first two waves were soon massing in numbers on Pulau Pak Amati. With Alfred providing much of the entertainment as his squads began to disembark. Death to the British! Screw them all! Let's go! Baka! Sodeska! Aye, aye, aye! Historically, the invading force faced challenges that Mother Nature threw at them as they made their way towards the, the beaches at Kotobaru. It was dark and the rough seas had three meter swells and there were strong winds. It was very difficult for the landing craft to maintain cohesion. They also had to contend with a strong side current that tended to push them further south. As Game Master, therefore, I made it a little tricky for the, for the Japanese players requiring them to roll 2d6 for each craft to see how far they would land from the intended disembarkment points. Initially, this did cause some uh, confusion for the players, but soon Nabil and Darren, and then later Alfred, Joshua and Darth, had regrouped and were ready to launch themselves at the defenders lined behind the palm trees. When the Japanese forces started to land, to our horror, Eugene announced that all Punjabi forces were inexperienced and our enemy were all veterans. Although we were dug in, we immediately felt that this is going to be one tough fight. The extensive network of barbed wire defences had taken months to erect and valuable time that could have been used in training was wasted on repairing what the salty waters of the South China Sea had been constantly eroding, hence the downgrade of all of Eugene's Punjab infantry squads. The Japanese, on the other hand, had been fighting in China and hence their upgrade of squads to veteran status. My role was the sideshow. It was to um, go up and distract the British forces to stop them from interfering with the main show. I was given a small platoon and no one expected this but I became Napoleon for a while. My Japanese troops cried banzai without fearing for their lives charging into the fleeing British forces. I as a small platoon had wrecked havoc in British forces and now I think the, and at that point I think the British forces were kind of more concerned on taking my force out rather than the main show. So now the late game plan is that with my small little detachment is hold, deal as much damage as I can to this slowly enveloping right flank and give my buddies on the left, the guys with the more superior numbers, a chance to maybe reconsolidate and uh, 
maybe reconstitute a new defensive line. But it doesn't, it doesn't look good for my guys on the right. So your units are over here? Yeah, we've got a small squad of five uh, anti-tank uh, grenade guys and two just regular rifle uh, squads. So far, I've been holding up okay, but I, I think they're going to have a nasty surprise next turn. Uh, our initial deployment was based on some faulty intelligence. Uh, so we deployed where we thought there was going to be a gap between two strong points from British forces. Unfortunately, most of the British forces were actually opposed to virtually none of our troops. Um, and yet those troops have done a really good job at actually holding up and keeping everything occupied at this end of the battlefield. We've struggled to get off the beach. Um, I think some good tactical movements here will keep some of these troops behind cover until they're getting close enough to actually make their next Banzai attacks. These guys are just going to continue Banzai off the beach. Banzai, Banzai, Banzai. Take the carrot, take, take the hits, take the pins and Banzai through. Because even if we take one casualty, to stop and fire will give them, give the British too much time to fire at us. We don't want to give them the rounds to top us. We're just going to charge forward. With Darren and Nabil in command, the Japanese launched their Banzai attacks against Eugene's right flank, with Evan taking it on the chin. As the Japanese were smashing into the thin lines of Ethan's defences, Anthony chose to play his trump card. The Japanese had recruited a small number of disaffected Malays into a fifth column organisation called the Tortoise Society. The Malayan police were aware of the society's existence and had arrested a number of its leaders prior to the Japanese landings. At Kota Baru, members of the society provided assistance to the invasion army and acted as guides. With their help, and very low visibility, the Japanese troops were able to infiltrate between the British units. You may play this card in one turn only from turn four on. Roll a die once for each of your commanders. So each of the commanders rolls a die. On a roll of three plus, a guide will appear and two of your infantry squads that are under your command may move freely 18 inches through the enemy player. And as it was, Back in December 1941, the guidance received from the Tortoise Society proved decisive, allowing the Japanese to infiltrate and outflank the defenders. But all was not lost for the Dogra Battalion, and as happened historically, the British Indian Army was able to regroup, and even stage counterattacks. Jared, for example, was able to deal with Dash and Alfred's breakthrough in the centre. Although Dash and Alfred had initially broken through my lines, I was able to successfully counterattack using my Bren gun carrier for support. Whilst Azul and Eugene moved their reserves south in an attempt to prop up Ethan's rapidly crumbling right. By the end of turn 6, with the British Indian Army having stabilised their centre, and with Japanese casualties beginning to mount, it seemed for a moment that the defenders may well indeed, against all odds, successfully defend RAF Kotobaru. But it was that faithful seventh turn that would finally see the attacking forces secure victory. Our Japanese forces holding here and then our main thrust of our attack through here and then sweeping around. Um, I think the seventh turn, going into that seventh turn, really gave us at the end a 50-50 chance to win and it came down to a little bit of luck then. The, our dice came out first and we were able to capitalise here and take victory here and also rush through here and take off this unit here. Because I think if you'd gotten the first dice, uh, this unit could have all, almost done the same to us in reverse and this unit would have fallen back further beyond our reach. And then I think you'd have been, you'd have been in a more secure location. So I think sometimes 
I mean, was it Napoleon Bonaparte who said, don't give me a good general, but give me a lucky one? So sometimes luck is what counts. And so, after almost seven hours of gaming, our big battle on level four of the Elias Community Center ended. The players participated as true gentlemen, showing gritty competitiveness, respect for each other and the rules, and a willingness to support each other, making for an enjoyable game, honoring and remembering those who pay the awful price of war. Whilst on tour of the battlefield, I had the opportunity to meet and chat with Chi and Zafrani on the very beaches where the first battle of the Pacific War took place. So Chi, as, as a Japanese person, how do you feel about it? I'm Japanese and he said I'm going to Thank you, Chi. You're right. We all have a responsibility to say sorry and to make peace and to keep the peace. If you're wanting to have Zafrani guide you on the battlefields of Malaysia, I've posted his email address here with his permission or you can find him on Facebook. So thank you all for watching. And I hope you enjoyed Fireteam Elias' 7,000 point bolt action game of the Battle of Kotobaru. Special thanks go to Darren for organizing the venue and for arranging a hearty lunch. Also thank you to Fauzi for letting us use one of his armies, the Japanese army, even though work kept him out of the game. And to all the members of our club, who contributed armies, terrain, for helping on the day.